I'm live. All right, let's start, people. Um, so thank you all for sitting relatively close. Um, just so you know, we are trying to run this like a round table, despite the rather formal layout. So we expect everybody to participate if you can, um, with whatever, you're, with whatever you are comfortable sharing. We would very much value that. Um, so the, the round table here is construction conversations about sexism and racism. I will say this is a little bit of an ambitious title and that I would like to be able to have constructive conversations about sexism and racism. I do not know that I am there yet. I'm relatively certain that I feel incredibly awkward when I discuss these things. Um, I also think that things tend to go a little sideways, even when I have the best of intentions and have really thought about my approach and things like this. And so I'm sort of hoping to learn um, from all of you uh, both what works and also maybe what doesn't. I'm happy to share my own mistakes with you, so you need not repeat them. Um, and I would, I'm just sort of hoping to have a little bit of a um, brainstorm about this topic. Um, I think this is an important topic to have a conversation about because this is one of our problems, right? If you look at um, what user research does, there are a couple of things. First of all, we serve business leads, we make products better and things like that. But one of the most fundamental ways that we do that is that we help designers understand their audience. And at least for me, and I recognize this as a privilege, I have a very clear mandate about who my audience is, which is everyone, right? Um, Paul Spencer has come out and he's been very explicit about this. This is great for me. It means that these sorts of topics definitely fall under my purview from a business perspective. But I would argue that independent of that, I think this is a natural topic for URs to carry about, care about and worry about because we worry about that kind of sense of empathy. And quite frankly, because we oftentimes help designers, like one of the sort of core functions we have with designers is we help them understand players who do not play like themselves, um, who are different from themselves. And we do this in a couple of ways. The most basic way is that we point out that if you engage with an object in a different way, you have a different experience. And NecroCube is sort of a classic example of this in that depending on where you choose to focus your eyes, you see a different cube. It pops out in different ways. This is perhaps the easiest of models for designers in my experience to understand. Um, if I go right and you go left, we experience the game in a different way. Similarly, you get sort of skill differences, right? Um, and people tend to understand that actually, yeah, that's a, that's a different experience and we should build to support those different experiences. Um, another common example of this that I run into in my day to day is when we point out to designers that actually mental models also really influence an experience. So you look at this painting, and I think um, if you just look at the physical affordances, the guy, the farmer with the red shirt, very much the locus of attention on this. But if I give you the title of this, it's The Landscape of the Fall of Icarus. Um, what commonly happens is you start a search pattern, because that farmer ain't Icarus, right? Where is he? He is, in fact, the pair of legs underneath the ship. And once you spot Icarus, it becomes a strange focus in this um, painting, right? It becomes really hard to unsee him. It really pulls your attention. And this is a great example of where someone's mental model changes the way they interact with an object, and then it changes their experience and their interpretation, right? When you think about things like learning systems, this is sort of the model that you, user researchers work with. Like, if I actually teach you how to interact with things, maybe you'll use them correctly and have a better experience, that kind of logic. Um, but when I think about sexism and racism, there's all the other phobias and dreadful things that we have to discuss um, when we're talking about humans. Um, I think we're actually moving from a cognitive to a cognitive model. So it's not necessarily changing behavior. An example of this is this image. Um, you can look at our face draws attention because face, um, and, but I can go through and I can give you a little bit more information about this, mainly that this is an example of post-mortem photography, or more bluntly, this is a picture of a corpse. And what's interesting about this is I don't think this necessarily changes the way people interact with the photograph that much, right? You still look at it in the same way, but it does fundamentally shift your interpretation of it. The creep factor goes up. Um, and I think this is actually the hardest model for designers to understand, and I think this is where sexism and racism really sort of reside, right? People come in, they have context, they have interpretation, they see the same things, they're the same things on the screen, and they just feel about them in very fundamentally different ways, right? So, the level of difficulty that you are brings to this is when we provide feedback, right? It is great to get people to agree 
we should not be sexist and we should not be racist. The problem is that when UR gives feedback, it's typically taking someone's excellent vision and pointing out there's a titch of the delta between what they think they're delivering and what they're actually delivering. And this, in my experience, makes giving this kind of feedback incredibly difficult. It makes it just profoundly incendiary because the designer's sense of identity gets tied up into this. Um, and it, it makes it just incredibly challenging. And what's interesting about this is if you look at this as a conversation between users and designers, this conversation is already happening. And the moment I see that, I think this is a conversation you are should be facilitating, right? You get these kind of things that people point out on the internet, and you get various responses from various game designers, some of which are graceful, some of which are less graceful, right? But what's interesting about this is this is a moment where we should be affording our designers the opportunity to embarrass themselves in private, not in public. Like, this is a fundamental service that we as user researcher, researchers offer. Um, and so I look at all of these things and I think, yes, these problems are UR problems. The problem with this is I'm not so sure I feel comfortable doing this, and I'm really curious how comfortable people in this room feel comfortable doing this. So I'm just going to start doing a game where we do shows of hands here. Raise your hand if this applies to you. Um, first off, how many people have noticed in any game ever, they've ever experienced some element of sexism, racism, homophobia, whatever your ick is, go for it. Right. Lots of people. How many people have noticed something that they have thought, uh-oh, about on a game they are working on, whether it's the process or the output? Okay? How many people have done something about this? And how many people thought, well, that went well just universally? Like, I, that, that was like tops, right? Like, I will say, for me, I certainly see things in my products, I see things in the world. I definitely spent a really an enormous amount of time thinking about these kinds of things. And I sometimes, nonetheless, don't act on stuff. Or when I do act on stuff, it goes a little squirrely. So, um, this is our first question for discussion. This is the audience participation part, just a big hint. Um, our question is just like, what led you to speak up or not speak up as a user researcher? I don't have a mic to hand you. I'll, I'll, I'm loud. Okay. So, um, oh, thanks. Well, I, I still haven't spoken up, so maybe you can help me. Uh, so the, the mobile game I'm working on uh, is in a fairly early stage of development. And the art team showed one of the new uh, antagonist recently, and it looked very much like an Arabic man to me. And it was with the, the team of you know, 20 plus, and I just, I didn't hear anyone else reacting to it that way. Uh, someone else spoke out about another character in the game and said, you know, he looks like kind of a meth head, the way he's twitching and acting and scratching. And this sounds so odd right now, I'm sure. And I thought, <laughs> oh, okay. Very common. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> But then the, it was kind of the big reveal about what this character was going to look like, and he was a bad guy, and he looked like an, very much like an Arabic man to me, and I just thought, I don't know if this is the place for me to say this, I don't know if I need to s single out someone to say this, perhaps I am overreacting, I'm still not sure how to handle this, and that's where I am at this moment. All right, <laughs> well hopefully we'll help with that. Do you want to say something? It's, uh, it's not related to your point, but... Um... I feel like one of the reasons I don't say something is I don't feel like I have a lot of credibility on this issue as a white male. I, I see it. Mm -hmm. I think it's weird. I'm not sure if, sorry, I'm not sure if, if me saying something about it is going to be productive or counterproductive. And a lot of times when I have said something, someone just kind of looks at me like, well, how do you know? And I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard because identity is tied up in all of these things. We can, let's be humans together and pass this over. To <laughs> okay. We had a concern with one of our games. Um, we released a game that had Nazis and KKK, and one of the characters in the early part of the game says the N word a couple times. We immediately thought, oh man, this could be an issue. So I can't, I'm not the best advocate for that because. The first thing someone said to me is, well, how do you know what the KKK is like? I don't. <laughs> I'm not going to invite a bunch of them in to find out. But 
let's yeah. find out what the perception is. So we asked people what their opinion of, what is your perception of this? How do you feel about use of the N-word in our game? And then we framed it with context, gave people information, why we're using it, setting it up correctly. No, it's not someone in, you know, 2007 saying it, it's the 1920s in the South. Frame of reference was important there. Those are like all awesome elements. I don't know if there's anybody else who let's pass pass and chat. Oh sure, I was just gonna I guess to answer the question. Uh, like knowing I've worked on Assassin's Creed three actually with some people in this room, and uh, which featured a native uh, protagonist who was half Mohawk, half British, and uh, what caused me to speak up was like knowing people who are Mohawk and mm -hmm. being close friends with people that were like in the depicted population. So. So, um, actually, I, I really uh, feel there are some questions about some games. I won't uh, quote anyone. Uh, but um, it's funny to hear that someone don't feel credible because he's white male. Because for me, this is the opposite. So, I think that if ever I would raise a subject, people would say, yeah, you, she speaks for herself and she's like animated, but this is not a subject. And the other point is that. Um, Actually, in, uh, in France, we cannot do uh, ethnographic uh, statistics because this is forbidden. So uh, this is a huge problem for us as well. That's interesting. I didn't realize that there were laws. And not only video games. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I can think of a couple of experiences working on Saints Row. Uh, yeah. I, I got, wow, I can just end the story there. Uh, there were definitely sequences where the game is meant to lampoon the racism, sexism, and homophobia in other games. And there are also sequences where I think we did really well. Uh, the fact that no one ever reacts to your player character's choice of gender or race or anything, of, uh, your voice or any of those things, never changes. So that's one way that we, we actively pursued trying to be more inclusive. But in other ways, uh, like the infamous Hoboat mission, uh, where you steal a cargo container full of high-end prostitutes, we had to put a lot more work into how do we actually handle this with respect? Which, yes, I know. <laughs> there was a line. We actually had to create a line. We actually had someone, uh, one of our playtesters came through who was a social worker and helped us more clearly delineate that line because referring to them as hoes in this context was we were making it clear we were lampooning the, the trope. But there was, I think, one or two instances where somebody called someone a whore, and the person pointed out, like, that takes it out of the lampoon context. That makes it more personalized, that creates more problematic content. Um, so we were able to get those voice lines changed so that there were, we, we kept it as respectful as we could when you're Saints Row. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So. I also worked at Volition on Saints Row in those games, so a lot of my experience comes from that as well. And what usually would lead me to speak up was especially if I had data points from playtest, because it was really easy for devs to just, especially, I was the vocal, you know, feminist in the company whose ideas were constantly dismissed as I'm just being overreactionary. Um, one of the methods I used to help with that was I would leverage Jordan as my white male and have him speak up about these issues because it was a lot easier for, it was a harder for devs to dismiss it when they couldn't just immediately write it off as, oh, it's just her feminist agenda speaking up. But if I could have clear data points and I could especially bring it back to, well, what is your intended design here? Like, what is your intended player feeling? And then point out, you're failing your players in some ways. Um, in Agents of Mayhem, we had a character who would slap other characters on the ass. And it entirely came from the whole sports bro culture. But when he was only paired up with female characters, he started slapping women on the ass. And we had female playtesters get really uncomfortable and point that out as, I would not buy this game because this makes me so uncomfortable. And I was able to go to our animation lead and say, is your intention with this animation to make people uncomfortable? And he's like, absolutely not. That's not all I want. I'm like, well, that's what's happening. You're having an unintended consequence. So especially I felt empowered as a researcher to speak up when I could reference specific feedback, which is why I think it's really important that we have a lot of diversity 
in the people we bring in to play test the games because then you get more data points to leverage as a researcher. That's awesome. So I'm actually yeah. going to be a lot to discuss. Apologies. I'll try to get back to other people. But um, I will say, from my own personal experience, like, um, yes, I do speak up. I do confront things that I see. But I run into a lot of pushback. And it is all over the place. Whether it's like, the what, why you call me racist? Like, that's not what I meant. I don't need to change this. My intent matters more than the impact. Whether it's things like, you know, like, that's like, we don't get those people. Right? Like, is, is essentially the argument. <laughs> Um, or uh, look at Saints Row, like, and that is an argument that people will give, right? Um, and it's it, it, or it fall into the like, really, this would make them them quit. I think they're being over. So there's just like there's a lot of pushback, um, and for me at least, there's a lack of established methods amongst us team. You are. Um, there's also a, frequently within teams a lack of consistent priority, and I say that as someone who has Phil Spencer saying this is a priority. Um, I, there's a lack of common language. It's real awkward to talk about these things because you said like the worst words just fall right on out of your mouth. Um, it's terrible. It's also really hard to measure positive impact. When I get a change in and like no longer and like having like a sort of terrible response from people, like how is like I don't feel good about that. I'm just like great. I've removed cancer. Right. That's not like and it, it doesn't have that kind of reward for me. Um, and oftentimes we're really fighting some uh, almost an established world culture, right? Like it's not intended, it's not intentional. There's not like the person in the KKK like trying to drive home their message through their art. It really just is a reflection of the world at large, which is incredibly hard to fight against. Um, and then finally, the riskiest topics are often just the most incendiary. Um, the things that I think are most likely to hurt people are also the ones that are most likely to be terrible to have a conversation about. And these. Uh, limit my ability to, or willingness, I guess, um, to necessarily go and have a healthy conversation about these things. At the same time, we are not the first people to think about this problem. And I have one of these questions. I know we started getting into a lot of sort of solutions. That's awesome. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about testing and things like that. But I just wanted to open um, by talking about some of these commonly available tools that are out there, right? And what I mean by that is things like this, unconscious bias training, right? Inclusive design for Microsoft tropes and versus women in video games, right? Um, memes that show up on the internet, right? These are things that are out there that are, I think, intended to sort of highlight this issue and bring positive change. And I just have a basic question, which is, um, are these tools useful to us? Or are they something where maybe they're well-intentioned but not actually doing what they need? Um, Um, I think it's hard, particularly um, in cases where it's like, okay, this is a required training that you have to go through, and then do people take that seriously, or are people sending images around the office about, look how stupid this is, like, whatever. Um, same thing kind of with memes, where it's like, it's something that is a serious topic, and we're trying to address it in kind of a lighthearted way, but does that, like, then diminish the conversation that we're having afterwards? Because, like, even in a lot of these things where, like, I I've heard a lot in response to the Tropes versus Women video, it's like, well, that's reading way too much into it. There's no way that was the intent. And you mentioned intent earlier. And especially with stuff like this, it doesn't fucking matter what your intent is if people get your game and they're like, this sucks. Like, um, so the player's responses is really what's going to dictate you know, and if we as researchers are trying to prevent that, like, hey, you're going to put this out into the cultural void and there's going to be this really, like, bad backlash to this thing and people are ignoring it because that's not the intent, like, how do you even have a discussion at that point? Because in intent doesn't matter, but that's all that they're focused on. That was kind of like a billion points. That sounds like a no. That sounds like a no. So can I get this back to that one over there? <laughs> Um, I actually kind of want to flip the question back to you in a little way because this inclusive design at Microsoft, I think last year you guys spoke on that as well in terms of uh, designing for folks with disabilities mm -hmm. and that was a fantastic talk. And so I'm just curious how you see your jobs as sort of the keepers of the platform, right, mm -hmm. that being Xbox, and how, how much of that is sort of push and pull to developers and publishers of games saying, hey, show us what you're working on and sort of then you present the tools and then you sort of suggest your feedback and then ultimately be a gatekeeper and say, this is too sexist for our platform, this mm -hmm. is too racist for our platform, you know, things like that. So I think as a platform, we don't get a lot of control if people are just sort of releasing to our platform. We get a lot of control if you're signing with us and we're investing in you. Um, and that's really where most of my work comes in. So 
Um, I'm currently the Studio UR lead for Global Publishing, which does, if you think of everything that isn't sort of 343 or turn time, like the, the big, big titles, I'm watching it. I worry a lot about what we're signing and whether we're going to get them out of concept and whether we're actually going to sign a long form with them. There, I have a lot of control, right? There is a separate question, and accessibility is a little bit different. And part of why I'm holding that out is, is, is one, in my experience, an easier conversation to have with teams because they worry less about intent. They mostly just sort of admit, like, gee, I didn't really think about that. Okay, I can do that. Um, but the other element of that is that it is easier to have platform-wide solutions to things like that. So when we talk about like remapping the controller buttons and things like that, you can do that at a platform level. It is hard to like unmutify characters, is what I'm going to say. Like there's or like delete words out of their like there, there's there's sort of a limit to what, what I think a platform can do from a tools perspective there. Um, that being said, I do actually think tools like this are really interesting. This is one of the ways that Microsoft, not just Xbox, like Microsoft, tries to go and make things better. Similarly, Google, right? And I give them total props for doing this kind of unconscious bias thing. But I will admit, um, my reaction is that these are not terribly useful for me. Um, I have a couple of problems with them. First of all, as the problem that I refer to as these sort of sexist, racist, ass doofus problem, which it does not matter what I say to somebody. The moment the words, so unconscious bias, come out of my mouth, they're like, why you call me a sexist, racist, ass doofus, right? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, there's a, like, an assumption that I am judging them as an individual rather than looking at their output, and that I am assuming that they're doing it intentionally or because they're somehow an imbecile. And this basically shuts down the conversation to the, to the point that you are having. Um, the other problem that I have, and it's something that actually you brought up, which is um, I think it actually undermines the confidence to act a lot of the time. So what's interesting about these trainings is that they're typically directed at the voice of normativity, right? Rethink your assumptions. Listen to everyone in the room. If you are the voice of the minority, I'm not really sure instilling a lack of confidence is like the greatest tool to sort of give people like this, right? There's kind of a challenge there, and it gets um, to people, a lot of people do voice that like nobody's going to believe me because I am not a blank or nobody's going to believe me because I am a blank, right? Whatever it is, it gets, it, it really undermines confidence a lot of the time. Um, I do want to call out one counterexample to this, um, which is this comic. This is the Best Shell comic, right? And there are two amazing things about this that I take from most. One, and I'm being very serious about this, it's the power of mockery. So when I want to go through and diagnose what is wrong with a product in front of me, I will oftentimes work on making fun of it. Um, and the reason I do this is that I think a lot of the trainings that we have here um, focus so much on the sort of negativity of the impact and they blow it up that it sort of conflates sort of the size of the impact with maybe the size of the thing triggering the impact, right? And so you get people sort of going through games looking for something that is really egregious, right? You're looking for somebody to be shooting MLK or something like this, right? And in fact, it's a lot more like smoking. Every single cigarette probably counts, right? And what's nice about humor, and particularly here, she does a really beautiful example of it, is she's calling out a pattern. And oftentimes when you're making fun of something, you can call it a pattern, even though each individual moment, it doesn't actually matter whether or not, like, it, you don't want to go through and say, women should never have romantic comedies, right? Like, that's not the takeaway here. The other element of this that I would say that is incredibly valuable and brings me back to user research is what she has built, despite the fact that she was writing, a, I'm sure, a very meaningful biographical story, what she produced is a KPI. It is a key performance indicator. The lady built a method, right? You got check boxes. Are you checking those boxes? If so, your interpretation is this. And suddenly we're back to a user research problem, right? And this brings us to the question I think some of you are already thinking about and that Jerome wanted to ask, which is... Oh, sorry, I gave it away. <laughs> all right, so yeah, I mean, I think some to some of the things that uh, you all are talking about, I mean, there comes a point where you just absolutely have to get feedback, whether that's internal feedback or as our primary job as researchers, research from con with consumers. And uh, I think there's often it comes up a lot of questions about like, should I do this? What's the right way to do this? And I will, I'll bring up an example from my past of wrong way to do this. <laughs> and I think so I was working on a game that um, I think similar to Saints Row, it had kind of a lot of comedic elements and trying to make fun of things, and I think that had a lot of Asian stereotypes in it. And it was something where, I mean, it was early in my career, and I, um, I didn't really know how to approach it, so I think my primary thing was, hey, I work 
I work with Asian Americans. We have Asian American participants. Let's just see if anything, anybody brings up anything negative. And nobody did. And it was something that it was only post-release that the team was surprised at their reviews. I think some things ranged from, this has questionable humor, to it's not racist, but, or <laughs> this, is, this is straight out racist. And I think some of that just comes from um, kind of a lack of understanding of a couple of things, like uh, reasons why people may not speak up or things may not apply to them. And also I think just like thinking about things like stereotypes. Uh, uh, a stereotype is all in good fun if it doesn't apply to you. But if it's been something that's been negatively applied to you, uh, it, can be very, it can be a very negative experience. So um, just curious about kind of any questions or thoughts people have about either instances where they have done research or have thought about doing research and how they how they've approached it. Do it in the back. Because the microphone doesn't get all the way in the back very often. Uh, this isn't too much about research per se, it's more of just an idea I've been having a lot when I think about these kind of ideas of racism and sexism, which is that I noticed there is a lot of stuff in high where you have the as the issue showed in the opening slide, we have this heavily armored dude where the exact same armor girl, there's like three pieces on it and stuff where, you know, it obviously has a level of sexism to it. But then to some people, they might be questioning just like, you know, it's like, oh, I don't really see how it's that bad. Until you think about it, the whole thing is that, well, the reason is because the contrast is the men have full armor, but the women have none kind of thing. So I feel like a good rule of thought could be just to have the, is it, if it, is it okay on a girl? Can it be okay on a guy too? Just though there was a webcomic they had this where they had Duke Nukem doing his Duke Nukem thing and he slapped a woman and they're like, dude, that's not cool. I was like, what? I can slap guys too. And he slapped Marcus Phoenix in the face and they're just like, yeah, but you're not getting context. So they put Marcus Phoenix in the bikini and then had Duke Nukem slap and I was like, yeah, okay, I see your point. And so I wonder if we should, if that would be a good rule for researching and trying to decide this stuff is the whole, if you put the person of the other gender or another race in the same situation, would it then be still considered okay doing that stuff? Because, you know, while it, right now you have the stuff where it's kind of weird to have see a woman in a scantily clad bikini of chainmail fighting in battle, what if you had Fabio in a bikini thong, or a chainmail thong going into battle too, you know, kind of thing is that in a sense shows that, you know, you're not just even as much concerned about it as more as you're just trying to push past the whole well, if we think something is offensive, then let's change it so it's not, rather than just let's hide it and it go away. And it sounds like that's a sort of heuristic technique that you might be able to apply as a user researcher um, for doing this. And there's some people back there. We'll come back. Does someone stop this first? Because I already got to ask a question. Do we need? Well, yes. Sorry. I just want to that was very generous. I would you. love to ask it, but I'll wait. Good karma. <laughs> So I've found in the past that the best way to get feedback um, that is going to be very useful is to always make it anonymous. So you can have someone play through your game or <clears throat> even just look at a character design or what have you and then ask them to give the feedback anonymously or um, if it's possible somehow um, have a team feed where you have anonymous feedback, whether that's um, if you're in Agile and you're doing sprints and you do retros, um, being able to anonymously say, hey, maybe we shouldn't have this character be in a bikini or um, what have you. So I think uh, there's a lot of power to being able to bring something up anonymously and then have the group discuss it. That way, uh, you're not being stuck by, oh, but I'm a, uh, or I'm not a uh, power. And I, I try to take a more principled approach um, in that I don't really care if the research suggests that 90% of men think women should be in the home or the other way around. I think that there's a principle that we need to abide by, and it doesn't matter what the research findings necessarily are. You don't need to prove your case. And so the way that I would do it as opposed to gathering feedback, and I'm, I don't do a lot of user research these days myself, is, is working with the leadership who define the culture of the studio and say, you know, 
well, what are your theories about like inclusivity for your games? And you know, can I rely on you to sort of, uh, and, and, and I talk to them, like I deal both with the individual implementers, but also usually like the founders of the companies are like, you know, we've got some issues, like talk to them, you know, the, the leaders privately and say, there are some issues with this game. How are we gonna best address them with your culture? And one prime example was a, a, a team that I worked with for years and years and years, and they're super progressive but they used all these horrible tropes for no better reason than they were just piloting, trying to get stuff in, and it was easy to get excited about some concepts. And it's just, you know, calling them out, it's like, you got, you said your culture is like inclusivity, and yet, like, have you had this? And it was, it was a tense discussion, but I think, like, I wouldn't want to collect research. I, I, I wouldn't want to go to the data for the answer. I would want to, like, look at the principles and, and sort of- Principles do help, and I will say, as somebody who's had a culture shift recently around being more explicit about what those principles are, they definitely, definitely help. I agree with that one, yeah. I definitely want to second, like the whole anonymity thing has worked really well for me in the past, as well as uh, going directly to uh, one of the stakeholders privately and discussing it with them has helped a lot. Um, the only other thing that I kind of stumbled on almost by accident is uh, we were doing like concept testing for some costumes we were looking at for one of our games, and the art team had supplied like a large variety of different costumes, including one in particular that was just like ridiculous ridiculously sexist like it was literally like BDSM she had a ball gag um, and so actually that like level of like basically the, the entire studio was able to agree like that's not acceptable and once you established like this is ridiculously not acceptable like other people were able to bring up oh I also don't like that this woman is dressed like this and I don't like that you know, like this character looks this way, I don't think that's appropriate. So almost like um, getting back to kind of that mockery thing, producing like that almost horribly stereotypical like apex of sexism or racism or whatever, like seemed to kind of break the ice in a weird way. Um, so I'm not necessarily suggesting like producing ball gag costumes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that seemed to kind of work for us that one time. Uh, I wanted to bring up a point relevant to the, the first thing we talked about just a few minutes ago, uh, envisioning your design with the other gender or the other races and seeing if uh, that would make it okay or more objectionable. We need to make sure that we keep in mind that there are different power structures uh, attached to uh, gender, uh, sexuality, race, so that a, I, I'll call out Saints Row again. Uh, just because we had a BDSM dungeon where there were guys in ball gags and leather restraints does not mean it's now okay for us to have women in those same subservient positions because that reinforces a pre-existing trope, that reinforces the, the pre-existing power relationship. So there's a dangerous argument, that, no one here has made it, but there is a dangerous argument that if you're willing to put dudes in a chainmail bikini, then chainmail bikinis are totally fine for women, which is actually a fallacy, because that is assuming that gender exists in a vacuum, and it absolutely does not. Yes, I mean, I think that that, that is definitely, you're, you're highlighting a couple of things. One is that there's oftentimes this idea that, well, if I'm fair, I'm fair. <laughs> Right, and it, it ignores the world at large. Um, the other thing I would mention, and this is something that I will raise as something I have certainly personally experienced, um, but it is a problem that I sometimes refer to as lady eyes, as in, I don't know, is that a problem? Let's go find some lady eyes, right? And like, put it, put them, all right, you could drag it, like, is this wrong? I have no idea, what is this? Why, like, what is the context and things like that? And there's, there's a challenge there, not only because one, it's weird and personal, like, and kind of creepy. Um, but two, my goodness, that was a complicated argument you just made, right? And to expect anybody who is a member of a, like, a minority class to be able to spontaneously articulate and understand the sort of narrative theory behind, or like, the sort of uh, social theory behind these sorts of things is just, that is a high, high bar, right? It is fascinating to me the number of user researchers who basically said my goal here is to argue them out of it rather than to collect data. And there are times when you can collect data, absolutely, I've done that, um, and things like that. One of the things I would actually mention is that um, there's the notion of anonymity, um, I would actually broaden that to, to the notion of a safe space, which I think is a little bit different. 
Um, and one of the things that a colleague of ours, Deanne, mentioned is that if you bring in women in pairs, she found that they were more likely to talk to each other because they had the common language and they could actually sort of voice these things um, and build off of their own experiences to sort of build the language between them um, because they felt like this was an audience who would hear them and things like that. And so I agree anonymity is super interesting as, as a tactic, particularly if you're looking at internal feedback. Um, where people are worried about reprisal. But I also think that thinking about it maybe a little bit more broadly in terms of just safety overall to give that feedback um, becomes valuable. Um, so. Yeah, my next comment basically plays off of both of those. Um, how to get best feedback from testers. Have a diverse research team. As a female researcher, I found female playtesters are much more willing to talk to me about things that make them uncomfortable as a woman um, than they would necessarily with a male researcher. So just me being a woman lets them feel like they have a safer space to discuss these kinds of issues. So diversify your research team, you're probably going to get better data. And then how to collect data internally. Um, when I was at Volition, I actually tried to give my devs a tool set. I founded an inclusivity advisory panel. We were a panel composed of people from multiple disciplines, multiple different backgrounds, and you know, I tried to get as many minorities represented from my studio as possible. And we set up basically an email alias. Anyone can safely, anonymously come to us. If you see something that went into the game that you think maybe shouldn't be there, come to this panel. You don't have to have your name attached to the issue. We'll discuss it internally in our panel and then bring it up to high level executives or directors and say, this is something someone brought up. Um, and it happened because I was getting the lady eyes problem. Everyone's like, oh, you're the person here who's super vocal about these kinds of issues. I'm going to come talk to you when I think, see things that are problematic. But I'm like, I'm just a user researcher. I can't fix problems. And so by establishing a way for my devs to try and handle the problems themselves and kind of let my whole team have a way to express their concerns with they saw issues in an anonymous way so they wouldn't have, you know, pushback. Um, it was the best way we could at a studio like Volition that makes notoriously sensitive games. Um, because it does happen. When you have 200 people working on a game, one person may not think something's bad, it goes in the game, and all of a sudden other people see it and go, ooh, maybe not? And so giving my devs a tool set so that they could try and solve problems themselves without looping in user research was fantastic. Cool, and actually gonna switch gears here because we have one more main topic, but um, I think a lot of good, good uh, consistent things around kind of ways to make it safer for people to get feedback I think is a really big thing and uh, both kind of on the internal and the external side. Um, I think kind of what we've seen, so we talked about is it really depends. I think a lot of things that came up were about kind of what is what is your team culture? What are the kinds of things you're looking to solve? And I think it's something you really need to think about kind of bringing your, I mean, as researchers, you bring your research tool set to problems all the time, and I think this is something, or what are the specific concerns here? What are the challenges here? How do I apply my research tool set so that I'm, I'm getting the best feedback in the best way? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who's going to talk about our final topic. So the question or topic that I wanted to sort of discuss is about tactics for actually having these conversations. So let's say we've identified something already, we've maybe gathered some feedback or know that we have a problem. How do we actually have discussions with our design teams? What kind of tactics can we use for that? Um, to sort of sort of ground with an example, you know, coming straight from graduate school, bright eyed bushy tail, I'm like, yes, we're gonna use some academic background research. I'm gonna show them these articles, this is my specialty area. We're gonna talk about this stuff that way. I'll send them articles and it'll be great. And of course that does not work. Um, because it's it, the, the framing is all wrong, it's not the same language that we're using. So I had to think really deeply about like how do I make this in a down-to-earth or more applied way that I can actually talk to teams and give them practical tips that they can use. So I'd love to hear some uh, you know, ideas about things that did work, tactics, frameworks that did work for you, and also what didn't work, and how did you sort of flip it around or learn from it in order to sort of proceed forward in the future? The model I first used was actually before I was in user research, I was uh, at a prison setting and we were doing group therapy for inmates who had been convicted of horrible crimes. 
And but the group therapy approach led me to believe that you actually might have more allies than you realize. They might just not feel like it's their turn to stand up. But like if you actually can get a group dynamic going and use maybe there are some techniques that are better than others for driving that, but then if other allies can speak up and start challenging and not just you, not just be the one person, I think that, you know, how do you how do you foster that? So any tools that would sort of help you identify your allies without necessarily calling them on the spot. But when you have multiple people talking about it and it's not the same person all the time correcting, doing the correcting, I think that's like extra effective. Um, I'm an ID, but it was not in uh, game user research, but uh, I used uh, to work in uh, neuroscience uh, like seven years ago and play with, uh, I used to play with psychometrics. And uh, there are some tests that are assessing um, association, implicit association. So basically they measure your biases. And that's also how I discovered that some, you know, racist biases. And so uh, I suppose there is a, a really an issue about safe space in order to assess yourself first, but also eventually to share. Uh, your your assessment about this, but I really wonder if uh, if you guys uh, in the room think it might be uh, maybe an idea you know, just to to start the conversation. And uh, I mean, it could be really um, um, probably brought out in a funny way, you know, about the mockery stuff. But when you are talking about lady eyes, I, I really thought about this kind of test and uh, psychometric assessment. There is one by uh, Harvard called the uh, implicit association test. Uh, I don't know if you're aware about it, but maybe it might be something to use. I don't know. Mm -hmm. oh. Go for it. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, I guess I have more of an example of, of what not to do when trying to have impactful conversations on these things. Also very uh, uh, I work as a, a freelance contractor and was recently approached with a project. Uh, I work in the board game space, not the video game space. And board games have a tremendous colonialism problem. Uh, so it was a project for a European publisher uh, about uh, settling lands uh, in a, a real setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and pretty much completely ignored the indigenous peoples of that setting. Uh, and I, I brought this up to them as they were kind of, we were negotiating contracts. And ultimately, I had to decline the job. Uh, they were very, very inflexible on a, a bunch of things. It's like, hey, this is going to be an issue for me if we continue to work on this project. You know, I know I'm going to be providing this feedback, you know, a month down the road as we, we engage. Uh, I think what could have made that a more impactful converse, uh, conversation for those of you, especially who work in-house at studios, is getting involved early. The earlier you can be bringing these issues to light, the earlier that you can be having these conversations, the more chance you're going to be able to kind of write the tiller on the ship. Uh, so, while I think that game is probably still going to release end of this year, um, uh, you know, as a as a contractor, I also don't want to have myself and my brand be associated with that. So, um, get involved early, I guess, would be my advice there. Absolutely. Um, I think another thing that's kind of important, because like we're having this panel because everyone's concerned about bringing it up, and we've already heard from other people in the audience who are like, you know, uh, it's kind of awkward to bring this up. I think one of the best ways to start this is to just start talking about it and normalizing it, because um, as another stuffy academic who's come into industry, uh, one of the things that I've tried to take away from that is like, when you have a question, it's not a stupid question, somebody else also is thinking the same thing, but you just need to be the person to actually ask it. And I think it's kind of the same thing here, where I'm sure there's somebody else who's like, I'm kind of uncomfortable about this, but not enough to actually say anything. And if you can be the person to be like, hey, I think this is wrong, that already opens the door for the other people in the room who might feel uncomfortable about it, but don't necessarily feel empowered to speak up. Um, so if we can all just support each other and start being loud about it, um, I think that's one way to normalize that discussion in the workplace. This is actually just a real quick comment, but the, um, part of the diversity training you do at Google is actually to take several rounds of the implicit association mm -hmm. test, uh, and every year, they say you need to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and That's back up? Um, James Danmore wrote a memo. Um, we're, I'm not going to talk about all the different people who are suing Google right now for various related things. Um, so not 100% effective yet, for sure. But um, 
that one of the things that, that is really brought home in all these discussions is that this is something that is okay to talk about. Mm -hmm. And not only okay to talk about, but that, like leaders are expected to talk about this, to talk about diversity, to talk about making sure everyone is, is feeling heard. Um, and um, like psychological safety in general is also like just another thing that um, you know, leadership is told to talk about when you join the company, you're, you're told this is a thing we care about getting right here. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good example um, to not to call out Google, I'm sure we all have people like this, but it, the, that particular example with the, the memo that went out and then the HR response to it actually was something that I had to deal at with a, amongst the leadership um, on my teams at Microsoft. Um, and it was actually, it was an example where I did leverage some academic work. I leveraged the um, Spelke Pinker debate um, and went through and I sent them a link because it's on the internet, of course it is. Um, but I also just wrote it up in an email and said, like, look, here are the arguments that people are making, and here is what, here are the counters to it, right? And this is why, from a science perspective, this has kind of already been solved, and not exactly the way that this guy is sort of thinking about it, right? Like, I'm not saying that any of his citations are off. I'm just saying that you need to look at it into the, the context of the whole, right? And I was able, because it is, in fact, my area of, not of expertise, but at least of education, um, to, to go through and translate some more academic work for people. Um, along those lines, but again, not for an individual team at a leadership level, that kind of thing. So, uh, so from a different pers perspective here, um, EA actually gets a lot of flack for being too inclusive a lot of the time. Like mm -hmm. that's actually a lot of uh, targeting, targeted hate on the internet with for saying, "Oh no, there's a homosexual agenda at EA and things like that." There's a lot of that that we we actually get that as feedback as well. Like uh, when we were working on. Battlefield Hardline, you know, the story that took place at the beginning, I think it was in LA or something like that, and so there's a Hispanic main character. And they're like, oh, they're, they're trying too hard to avoid the norm and be spe their special snowflake, that kind of thing that you hear about all the time on the internet. Um, and so, as a lot of people have been alluding to, uh, the biggest thing that EA has done, and this has come down from the board, from the uh, studio leadership and things like that, is that a lot of this change comes from the top down, and so establishing that culture of inclusion, that it, it, it starts from the top and you have to start from there. Um, one of the EA board members who actually gave a talk uh, was Len Coleman who worked in baseball for many years. And he was talking about how basically what happens is that you find the people who are willing to have a conversation at the top level and you keep them there. Um, like he was talking about how uh, especially in things like baseball, and he was applying that to video games, it's a lot of it at the leadership level. You can't really listen to the masses and expect the masses to have a reasoned conversation. You have to really aim to make it so that, number one, the leadership creates that culture where it becomes safe and okay to talk about these things. And I would also point out that leadership is actually something to leverage when you're having these conversations. I write a lot of relatively embarrassing emails right now in one of the games, it's in concept that I can't talk about, but it's doing a lot of high risk things. Um, and every time I write one of these really somewhat graphic emails, um, I immediately send it to Randy, right? It, he is my manager. It's the kind of thing where he is, unless he's gonna stop me immediately there, he is now on the hook for defending and things like this, right? <laughs> and he's got something to say. <laughs> Thanks, well, so there's another aspect of this around like the, the creating the safe environment that goes beyond just the, the content, but the working environment with your people. And if you're lucky enough to be in a position to have leverage, and I think a lot of the people, the more senior folks, uh, managers here probably do, exercise the, the right to make a stand. I've had conversations, walked into VP's office, the studio manager's offices, and said, if this shit doesn't stop, we're pulling your support. It's that simple, because we have a choice of where we invest and where we where we put our folks, and that will scare the crap out of them. Like, they'll, they'll hear that. It's like, oh, it, it actually is going to negatively impact uh, my business or the way that I do things. If you're going to take something away from me, let's, let's have a talk. So if you're in that position, don't be afraid to make an obnoxious statement like that. Because, I mean, ultimately, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You have to, you can't back it up, and maybe you do need to keep them on a product. But to the other uh, person's point there, having the conversation, making it okay to, to openly talk about these things is really, is really the first step. And you kind of have to stick your neck out there a little bit. And I'd also say one of the other things that makes 
Right. I'd say one of the other things that that really helps out with too is the issue a couple of people brought up earlier, which is about identity issues and coming from a background where um, either your thoughts might be discounted because you come from a majority group or your thoughts might be discounted because you come from a minority group. Having that kind of support and background and knowing that there are other peers in your team that you can sort of bounce ideas off of, get some peer review for that, say, hey, you know, how does this look? Can you help me wordsmith this mail? Or how am I going to have this discussion? That's been really helpful and supportive in that way. So using your team members in that way, if you've ever got those kind of concerns, that's a, a strong support in that, in that area as well. I use her for that all the time, and it's interesting that Melissa is the one bringing this up, right? Because I think one of the things about it is that even if I'm the one who's writing the email and sending it, the person who gets to review it nonetheless gets to have that sort of learning cycle um, and go through and think about the problem set. And that is, I think, also valuable, I hope. Because I, like, I do this a lot to her. So. One thing I find pretty impactful is using the company's words to embrace your argument. So like, I work for Blizzard, and we have eight core values two of which are play nice, play fair, and every voice matters. And if you can find ways to weave those into your email, it becomes very impactful. Or even in your statement in a meeting, it becomes much more impactful because now you're using the company's vision to back up your argument. Absolutely. So I just wanted to quick tie into that. Because one of the things that I find really interesting um, as a defense that was mentioned earlier is this idea, well, I didn't intend to do that. Um, but as user researchers, we talk about design intent every day. You know, I've run titles, or I've run studies where someone was going through a stealth tutorial and they found a forklift and drove over the people who were supposed to kill them if they didn't sneak past them. And the designer does not turn around and say, well, I didn't intend for them to do that. Um, and obviously, the difference here is these are issues that are, uh, people are more sensitive about, and you have to be prepared to deal with people's fragility. Um, but at the same time, I think if someone says, I didn't intend for that to be hurtful, that's a great opening for you, because your, our job is to communicate the user experience. And you get to point out, well, it, it's a good thing you didn't intend to do that, because you're failing. And <laughs> now that's we can talk about how to be successful. Right. Yes, I do think establishing intent is important on some of these things, yeah. <laughs> I promise I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> but that is, that is one of the most important things, and it's, it, was, it was brought up before as well when we were talking about this earlier, is that intention is not the same thing as impact. And trying to talk to teams about that and using that as a tool is really important, and saying, okay, I'm sure that's not what you intended to do. Your intentions were good. As a matter of fact, I sometimes use it as a technique as well. I'm sure your intentions were good here. However, that's not the impact that it's having. Let's talk about how people are actually seeing it. What context are they coming from? What perspective are they taking? Um, and how can we use that to sort of convince teams, okay, yeah, sure, you were trying to do something good here. But let's think about how it's actually impacting the players. Sounds good. I'll, here, I think I have a mic, so you can keep that. All right. So um, I want to finish with this question, but I'm not going to let any of you answer it because I think um, I think the answer is this has to be decided personally, not in a group. And the reason I think that's important is because this is an exceptionally high risk topic to engage with at a very personal level, right? And I don't I don't have a great way to calculate your risk. I don't have a predictive model to figure out whether or not like, the cost is going to be worth the impact for you. Um, what I do know, however, is that if I were to just think of things that were happening in the news and things like this, I might think that this is an exceptionally high risk thing to do. And I just want to point to two things. One, this conversation seemed to go OK. Right? Nobody got in a lot of trouble. And I will say, this was the number one concern of the people who did the review passes. It's like, oh dear God, what happens if this goes off the rails? Right? It didn't, because we're great people. <laughs> right? um, but the other thing is, I just want to leave you with a case study to keep in your mind, because I find it useful. Um, when you think about like just judging risk, um, and it is the story of Semmelweis and Pasteur. Right? These are two very good scientists who had two very distinct outcomes to their lives. Um, Pasteur, I imagine everybody has heard of, he has a big fancy word, pasteurize, to immortalize him forever. He's also got statues and stamps and all sorts of like plaudits and things like this. Um, his ending was a happy one. Uh, before he started doing his work, however, um, there was some advice, and his ending is not a happy one. He ended up uh, basically thrown in a straitjacket by a committee of 
peers, including Wagner, I don't know why, but he was allowed to make that call. He attempted to break out of um, the mental hospital, at which point they beat him to death. Not a good ending. Um, and there's a question of was, why was one of these scientists successful and one of these scientists not successful? Um, it is, for the record, not due to the quality of their science. And this is important for us as scientists to recognize. Um, so Pasteur built a bunch of very fancy glassware and then demonstrated that um, essentially if air couldn't carry par particles to a sterilized fluid, it wouldn't ferment. He did a bunch of neat controls, did some good science. Um, Semmelweis did a study where he had two clinics, one of which seemed to be killing off women at a sort of astonishing rate every time they gave birth, and one of which didn't. Um, he figured out that it, maybe it had to do with hand washing, had an intervention, lowered the rate of death. Again, really good science. Um, it's also not their conclusion or their recommendation. Uh, so both of these people basically come up with germ theory, and both of them are like, doctors, wash your hands, right? <laughs> like that's, that's their conclusion. Um, and so we start looking at these sorts of things. It is important to recognize this. I think sometimes it's hard for researchers to not think, if I was just a better researcher, I would be able to persuade people. Or if I just asked for the right thing, I would be able to persuade them. Um, and in this case, it, that's, that's not the deciding factor. Instead, there are a couple of things. For one thing, um, Semmelweis crossed a number of sort of social norms when he made his argument. The reason why those two clinics, the pink line and the blue line, were responding differently um, is that the people who were working in them were very different. The pink line, which killed a lot more people, was filled with male doctors, or more importantly, medical students, who were getting a ton of education and spent their education time cutting up dead things, and then moved immediately into the birthing chambers, at which point they were infecting women. Conversely, the blue line, the lower line, was um, with a bunch of midwives who washed their hands a lot more. And when he went through and made this recommendation, he didn't just solve something for germ theory and for science. He went through and he broke a number of norms. And this is a contrast to Pasteur, who rescued something everybody could agree to rescue, which was beer. <laughs> it was important to rescue beer, right? And I think it's interesting, because on the one hand, yes, you see this kind of rhetoric when you talk about games here. So people talk about it, and it's not about the people who are getting hurt, it's somehow gaming itself that's getting hurt. Um, and on the other hand, I would point out, there is a really solid argument to point out, the, to, to argue that games essentially are the beer of entertainment, right? And I think that is something that we can leverage. The other element to this that I would say is that Pasteur had a better sense of because. Um, he could go through and say, I think the beer is sour because I can explain to you that these, air, these little particles that are being carried through the air, they're what cause fermentation to begin with. And there's good fermentation and there's bad fermentation. And what's interesting about that is because he had that sort of lovely because, where Semmelweis just had a pattern and he couldn't really explain what was going on, he could get people to buy into his argument. And I'm going I'm to just state, I think that gaming has a very similar because. I don't know what all of you are working on. It's probably a secret and I'm not allowed to. But I can guarantee that you are going to worry about balance. You are going to worry about fairness, right? And this is our because. Why do we do this? Because it makes things fair. Because it gives us balance across a variety of audiences. And I think that's something that we can leverage when we make these arguments. And it's one of the reasons why I at least believe that the odds of success are somewhat higher than some of us. I'm not saying you're going to get a statue. And I do want you to all be safe, right? And so it is important to, to calculate this personally. Um, but I do think that there is significant, significant opportunity to have profound impact on the world by doing this. So thank you very much.